Good morning. I'm Chris, and uh, I'm so thankful that you've chosen to come and join us this weekend as we continue our series on the Holy Spirit. As we continue our series today, we're going to dive into how the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. But I'd like to start off today with something a little fun, some true or false questions. So I'm not going to ask you to do anything crazy, just raise your hand. So no pressure. So we'll begin with true or false. Lightning cannot strike the same place twice. Raise your hand if you think that's true. All right. Now raise your hand if you think that's false. All right. That's the majority. It is false. It can strike the same place twice. Uh, True or false? A cheetah is the fastest animal on the planet. Raise your hand if you think that's true. Got a few there. Raise your hand if you think that's false. It is indeed false. It's the fastest land animal, but the fastest animal is a peregrine falcon at 200 miles an hour, which is crazy fast. Now, the last of these ones, true or false, golf balls have between 300 to 500 dimples on them. Raise your hand if you think that's true. All right. Raise your hand if you think that's false. And now raise your hand if you're not a golfer and don't care either way. (laughs) There we go. It is true, in case you want to know. Now, knowing which of these questions are true is probably not going to affect your life all that much, except perhaps as maybe a fun factoid at a gathering with family and friends. But how about a couple more serious ones? Now, true or false, if you're a store manager... Do you have the right to detain someone accused of shoplifting until the police arrive? Raise your hand if you think that's true. And who thinks that's maybe false? It is indeed true. Now, if you're a store manager who's detained someone who's been caught with stolen goods, true or false, you have the right to search their pockets and backpack for more stolen items. Raise your hand if you think that's true. All right, now raise your hand if you think that's false. It is indeed false. You have to wait for the police to arrive. Now, while those first three questions are not going to change your life all that much, if you're a store manager who's trying to prevent theft, then knowing the answer to those two questions could be the difference between being on the right or the wrong side of the law. In these situations, knowing the truth about what the law says you can and can't do is critical. In our focus scripture for today, Jesus is talking to the disciples about how he will be going away, but is promising to send them the Holy Spirit who will guide them and counsel them into truth that really matters, that is critical. In John 16, 13, this is our focus scripture for today, Jesus tells his disciples, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Now, knowing the truth is important. And while there may be some gray areas at times that are difficult to discern, we do know that God has given us a conscience, which, though at times clouded by sin, helps us to know right and wrong. Romans 2, 14 to 15 says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Now, we all have likely experienced that pause at some point in our life, hopefully, that says, hold on there. There's something wrong about this. And at times, we know immediately why, and other times, we may just feel like something's not quite right. As we talk about the Holy Spirit guiding us into truth, it's important that we first acknowledge the capacity that God has already given us to discern truth. That's His grace to us, even before we've received the Holy Spirit. Even though sin clouds our understanding of right and wrong at times, God has written on our hearts a sense of what is true and right. Perhaps a little like driving down a highway and you encounter a sign that says, 
dangerous curve ahead. Now, you can read the sign, and so immediately you're confronted with a choice. You could observe the sign and slow down. You could ignore the sign and just maintain your speed. Or you could even defy the sign and speed up. It's not that we can't read. It's not that we have no ability to tell truth from untruth or right from wrong, but rather that we refuse to heed the warnings that we do see. And if we practice ignoring those warning signs long enough, then we gradually begin to find it easier to ignore them over time. This is like the deadening of our conscience. However, that reality, of course, doesn't change. Our response will not change the truth of that dangerous curve ahead. The curve remains dangerous, regardless of whether we acknowledge that fact or not. And so what the Holy Spirit does when he comes and dwells within us is that he, this truth, he applies the restoration that we have through Jesus to our hearts and our minds and renews our conscience where it's been damaged. He restores that broken sensitivity to sin within us and is our guide into truth and renewed life in Jesus. Romans 8, 1 to 6 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. This is perhaps the first way that the Holy Spirit actively leads us into truth. As he removes the fog that our culture sometimes seems to be in. Contrary to what we may hear in culture when it comes to truth, We're not choosing between multiple options. As Romans 8 says here, we're either living according to the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth and peace and life or according to the sinful flesh which leads to bondage, corruption, and death. Yes, there may be multiple ways to go wrong, but there's only one way that leads to truth and life. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, to illustrate this, there's a story that I heard of a man who came to his old friend, who was a music teacher, and he said to him, what's the good news for today? The old teacher was silent as he stood up, walked across the room, picked up a hammer, and struck a tuning fork. I'll have to be very quiet to be able to hear that. It's a small tuning fork. As he struck the tuning fork, the note sounded out throughout the room. He said, that is A. It is today, it was 5,000 years ago, and it will be 10,000 years from, from now. The soprano upstairs sings off key. The tenor across the hall flats on his high notes, and the piano downstairs is out of tune. He struck the note again. That is A, my friend, and that is the good news for today. A little like the soprano, tenor, and the person playing the piano downstairs, sin has damaged our ability to harmonize properly with that A of truth and follow it. We acknowledge right or wrong, and yet sin, worldly philosophies, makes things feel like a big gray area. And perhaps a little like that soprano upstairs, we're off-key from the truth. Or because of brokenness from our past and our weakness to temptations, we end up flatting like that tenor across the hall when the time comes to hit those high notes of truth and do what is right. Or while we know that pleasure is fleeting and happiness is momentary, we still strive after it. Our decisions are made to chase that pleasure and happiness. 
And so, a little like that piano downstairs, we end up out of tune in everything that we do. You see, the part of the hard news as we're talking about this is that while we do have trials in life, temptations from the enemy, and competing messages from the world, it's actually our own brokenness, which is ultimately to blame. Paraphrasing what the early church theologian Augustine once wrote, all too often, we as human beings either desire the wrong things or we desire the right things, but in the wrong way. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth, to reorder our desires so that we seek after things that both satisfy and will lead to life, flourishing, peace, and joy. James 1, 14 to 18 says, But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of everything that he had created. Often we ask the question, how can I discern truth? With so much misinformation out there, how can I tell fact from fiction? The simple answer is that we build our lives on the foundation of Jesus, the living word, the way, the truth, and the life. And how do we do that? Well, Jesus indicates this as he's actually talking to the Pharisees in John 5, 37 to 39. He says, And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice or seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Jesus is saying here that if God's word dwells in us, if we believe in him as the one that the Father had sent, then we will understand that these scriptures contain life because they testify about him. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not apart from God's word, but rather he is the living word. Time after time, Jesus clarifies and guides his disciples into the truth of God's word, Thus, Jesus didn't send the Holy Spirit to replace the Bible, but to take up his place in leading us into God's truth within his word. Thus, we set our foundation on Jesus by receiving God's word as our standard of truth and the Holy Spirit as our guide into that truth. It's because of the Holy Spirit that our Bibles are not simply books full of ancient words and pithy wisdom, but are the very words of God for us. As theologian John Frame puts it, the Bible is God's personal communication to us. God speaks so that we can understand him and respond to him. Romans 8.14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Holy Spirit uses God's personal word, the Bible, to lead us beyond simply being called children of God to living in the kingdom of God as children with all of its benefits. He guides us into all truth in God's word because as 2 Timothy 3.16 to 17 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Holy Spirit applies the truth to our whole life, including daily decisions, big life choices, and how best to reflect Christ in all of our relationships and in the work that we do. The Holy Spirit as our guide doesn't just illuminate what is true, but also guides us to apply it. This is how we can be confident that we are listening to that A ringing out true and clear and how we can then harmonize with it accordingly. There's many voices and philosophies that claim to represent that true note. 
Yet those things, even if they're at times close to that A of truth, they don't harmonize with the truth. Similarly, as many great Bible teachers as there are out there, Jesus didn't promise the Holy Spirit to those few so that they would be our guide into truth, but Jesus promised all of us the Holy Spirit as our guide into the truth of God's word. We may need to ask ourselves, am I only listening to other people talk about the Bible? That includes me standing up here. Or am I reading or listening to it and studying it myself? Solid and trustworthy Bible teachers can be very helpful, but we need the Holy Spirit to guide us into the truth of God's word so that we're not easily deceived. But even more than that, because as our guide, the Holy Spirit walks with us in relationship, bringing God's word to life in our own personal lives. The Holy Spirit guides us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus alone, the way, the truth, and the life. It's perhaps not too surprising that this is one of the central concerns within all Scripture, is that we would keep our eyes fixed on God. The Old Testament points to Jesus and the kingdom that he will usher in. And the New Testament declares him as the pinnacle of God's plan of redemption and this kingdom which has drawn near. Yet time and time again, we see God's people turn away from him. And similarly, for us today, the most insidious danger that we will face as Christ followers is not actually death or suffering, but going astray, shifting our attention from Jesus and him alone to other things. In John 15, 18 to 27, we hear Jesus summing up much of what he had taught his disciples and then following this summary with, in John 16, 1, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Jesus reminded the disciples of what he had taught, what the truth was, so that they would not forget the truth and fall away. This is also what the Holy Spirit is doing with us as he guides us into truth. The Holy Spirit is reminding us of what we've received in Jesus, namely, forgiveness of our sin, being declared righteous, peace with God and relationship with him, a hope of the glory of God, and being declared children of God, and as children of God, being invited and empowered to witness to the kingdom of God which Jesus brought near and which we participate in. When we forget these things and our focus shifts away from Jesus, then we begin to falter. And as we falter, we begin to lean on other things to try to satisfy what only God can. Are you struggling in your faith? Maybe you're just not satisfied with where you are right now, but you're not sure how God's word fits into or speaks into your daily life. Perhaps you've actually begun the process of deconstructing your faith and feel like it's just a thousand pieces laying on the ground. Or perhaps you're a new or seasoned believer who knows there's more, but you just don't know where to go next. Wherever you find yourself today, the Holy Spirit knows what you need. I myself have been in a difficult and dry place, times when I felt that I had lost touch with God, times when it seemed like I couldn't get anything out of my Bible. I questioned if God had ever spoken to me. I had no peace. I had no sense of his will in my life. I wanted more peace and more joy. I wasn't finding it. Life seemed dry and hopeless, and honestly, my Bible was the absolute last thing that I wanted to read. I remember such a time in my early 20s. I felt exhausted by it all. It was a dark time. So one night, while I was in a really tough season, I just cried out to God, why? Why does it have to be so difficult sometimes? Then God flashed his answer in my mind like a neon sign. The question was, what are you eating? 
That's what your body will be accustomed to longing for when you hunger. So when you feel dry or hungry, what are you using to satisfy that hunger with? What are you eating? And then a story I read once came to mind. It was about a man who was trying to cut costs. So he began to gradually substitute sawdust in the oats of his mule. Everything was fine for a period of time, as he was indeed saving lots of money. And the animal seemed satisfied with the sawdust. Then the mule died. I saw the same in my spiritual life. I exchanged feeding on the truth of God's word with the sawdust of pleasure and leisure. And before I knew it, I was feeling spiritually dead. And as I felt less peace, I fed more on the sawdust of things that would just numb and distract me from what I was feeling. I watched movies that pushed the envelope, endlessly scrolled my phone, lounged around my basement eating junk food, and was not putting my best foot forward at work. Can you relate? Have you been through a time like that? What does your spiritual life look like? Do you feel like you might be struggling? Perhaps because you, like me, disconnected yourself from the source of life and truth. For myself, it took time for the stubborn mule in me to finally listen to the Holy Spirit. It was not easy. The Holy Spirit, I felt him, led me first to cut out any film that was not G-rated and then eventually to cut out all movies and TV altogether for a while. And then I felt him lead me for a while to keep my phone by the door with the ringer on, but not to have it on me when I was in the house. All this cleansed my mind. To fill it, I felt God convict me to spend a minimum 30 minutes a day in my Bible, and eventually to join a Bible in a year plan alongside others. I changed my eating habits, and I didn't buy any more junk food, I exercised, and I prayed to God to help me honor him with my body. And then I prayed each morning and afternoon about honoring God with my work, which actually changed my perspective on the work that I was doing. If you're struggling right now, I would love to talk with you and pray with you. And we have a prayer team who will meet you under the cross that would love to talk with you and pray with you as well. I can personally testify that the Holy Spirit comes upon those genuinely seeking. When we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, change happens. If you need the Holy Spirit's guidance and transformation today, don't leave here without getting prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to build upon him as their foundation for living wisely, responding to difficult questions in life, and preparing for what is still to come. Yet the disciples had so much more to learn, and they needed the wisdom of Jesus to both remember and continue to grow in the wisdom that only God can give. In John 14, 26, Jesus says to them, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. That is the very same Holy Spirit who is active today in those who have put their trust in Jesus, reminding us of God's faithfulness and what he's taught us through his word and also leading us into all truth as we grow in wisdom from God. As our minds are stayed upon the word of God, guided by the Holy Spirit, God's truth fills our hearts, our minds, and our very lives. In a way, when I tasted the goodness and freedom of following the truth, it actually created a new hunger in me, which led to life instead of death, like a hunger for oats instead of sawdust. Again, Jesus says in our focus passage, John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit leads us into all truth through the whole story of God's word, from Genesis to Revelation. 
his personal revelation of himself to humanity, his plan, which is from the beginning to restore humanity as his imagers to the rest of creation and, and restoration of creation itself, holy, incorruptible, everlasting, and all this through the Son, Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit comes to guide us into all truth, he does so within relationship, coming alongside us to renew and restore us and heal what's been damaged by sin, namely our conscience. He makes us alive to the truth and he restores our conscience and becomes our guide, setting us firmly on the word of God as our standard of truth. The Holy Spirit continually guides us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. That we might feed on the life-giving nourishment of God's wisdom instead of the sawdust of our own limited wisdom, worldly philosophies, and selfish desires. We have confidence that if we follow, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth and make us spiritually alive. The Holy Spirit is willing. Are you willing to come under his guidance into truth? I want to take a couple minutes here and reflect on a few questions. If you have the uh, sermon notes, it's on the back. Reflection questions. We're just going to take a few moments to reflect on these questions. Will you invite the Holy Spirit today to show you where you may be ignoring the warning signs, that dangerous curve ahead, and allow him to restore you? Will you invite the Holy Spirit today to show you where you're listening to the wrong things, those off-key notes, instead of that true A ringing out clear? Will you invite the Holy Spirit today to show you where you're feeding on the sawdust of selfish desires instead of the edifying truth of God's word? We'll take a few moments and then we'll pray. Holy Spirit, we come before you. We need you. Enliven our hearts, tune our minds, and shift our lives to listen and follow your lead. Show us your ways. Guide us into truth and teach us to look to you as the one who leads us on level ground and reveals to us your will and how we may walk in it. Amen. Well, I thank you for joining us this morning. And as we do after every service, uh, we end with a blessing. Um, as we've been going through this series, we've been taking our blessing from Acts 1.8. And then um, afterwards, I just invite you to say, Holy Spirit, come. So I invite you to rise. And if you'd like to receive the blessing, you can put your hands out to just say, yes, God, I want whatever you have for me today. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you go, I pray that God would continue to lead you and continue to speak to you. May God bless you as you enter into another week.